special time of year. When I was a boy, we would, uh, I grew up in Newport. My family moved there when I was three months old. And Newport is not the capital of Perry County. It should have been, but it's not. It's, the county seat is in New Bloomfield. But it's a, the largest town in all Perry County, which is not saying much, is it? As far as the Perry County being a lot of small towns. But every year <clears throat> at Christmas, Christmas Eve, we would uh, journey over here. My mom grew up in Halifax. My dad was born and raised in Wickenesto. And we would come to Wickenesto. We'd come to Halifax, see my grandparents, my mother's parents there briefly. But Christmas Eve was spent with my dad's father. My grandmother died when I was a few months old. Uh, my dad's mother, I never knew her. But we'd come to my grandfather's house. And there we would spend Christmas Eve with my grandfather and my Aunt Millie. Uh, my Aunt Millie was a spinster, never married. She's still alive. Uh, she's 91, 90. She's 90. She's still not married. But uh, it was quite a treat. We would go there. And do you know what we waited for on Christmas Eve at my grandfather's house? What do, what, what do people around here wait for on Christmas Eve? Do you know what they wait for? The, the Santa Claus truck to come around. And uh, my aunt would be constantly looking at my, aunt, my aunt's death. She, with a hearing aid, she turns it up loud enough she can hear. But she calls me looking out the door. It was up on Mountain Street. And all of a sudden, she let out a great big squeal. Here he comes, here he comes. And we'd run up to the top of Mountain Street to get our popcorn balls that they would throw. And that was a special treat. But then that, we would go home. The next day, my mother would always have dinner. Both sides of the family would gather at our house. But it was a big deal for my brother and I. My brother's four years older than me. I'm 56, so he's going back some years now. But we were not allowed to get downstairs on Christmas morning until mom and dad. Well, until they said we could go down. And they would be a minute or two or three behind us. But we were not allowed to touch anything uh, until they said we could. So in our home, when you come in the front door, it was like a hallway that went, like a pathway that went to the kitchen, the dining room was here, here was the living room. And my brother, being the older one, was taller than I. Christmas morning, he could lean out over the banister. You know, before anybody, you know, he was very sneaky. He was always sneaky one of the family. And he could look into the dining room because that's, we, mother never had, but we didn't have, we didn't have a dining room set. But uh, that's where the gifts would be, and then later after we'd open the gifts, Dad would bring in a table and get ready for uh, Christmas dinner. But he would lean out over, and he would come back, and he'd say to me, David, he came. He's been shot. What an excitement that was. Finally, we'd get downstairs, and we'd wait anxiously for and everything. I don't know how it is in your home, but my mother, uh, I don't know how I want to describe her, Things were done in, in an orderly fashion, you know, so, and then we were told what to open and when to open. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> I remember those Christmas gifts of many, many years ago. They were gifts of uh, baseballs and basketballs, baseball gloves, games, toys, <laughs> clothing, a couple pairs of slabs, maybe a pair of shoes, ice skates. And of course, my favorite gift of all was when you opened that package and it was a brand new pair of Fruit of Loom underwear. That was such a wonderful gift. <laughs> they got tossed to the side in a hurry. <laughs> we had a bike, you know, once in a while. Every couple of Christmases, we get a brand new bike. Boy, that was exciting. And it always amazed me. It was the same bike that I saw at Joe the Motorist when I stood there with my dad. That's the one I want. That's the one I want, Sam. I was a kid, Joe the Motorist. How many remember Joe the Motorist down at the Uptown Plaza? That's where the real Santa Claus came out. Know? Joe the Motorist, oh my gosh, that's going back some years. But uh, one year my brother and I got lightning glider slits. You know, lightning glider slits oh, yeah. made in Dunn Cannon. Yeah. Perry County, the finest, greatest sleds yeah, in all the world. We got brand new lightning glider sleds one year at Christmas, and guess what? It did snow. It did snow that time. <laughs> 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 Not enough to go sledding. Now you say to me, where? 
all those memories. Whatever happened to all those gifts? I can't say that we have saved one pair of ice skates or one gift. They live on in my memory, but they're gone. I recently read about another gift that was given to the world. It was a blue 45 carat diamond. It is known as the Hope Diamond. In 2011, it was estimated to be worth $250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars. They say diamonds are a girl's best friend. They don't do a whole lot for me. <laughs> uh, I bought my wife a diamond one time, only for it to be stolen later on in life, but I did buy her a diamond. And I remember her reaction when we picked it out. I put money down on it. She cried and ran out of the store. But I wasn't sure she was crying because of the inexpensiveness of this diamond that I was buying or because she loved me so much. I'm going to think it's because she loved us. <laughs> this Hope Diamond has been sold many, many times, but the last owner of the Hope Diamond donated it to the Smithsonian Museum as a gift to the world. Wow. I want my piece of the rock. Yeah. You think if I went to Washington next week, and I, I don't, you know, how many was there? There's over six billion people in the world, correct? They used to say there was a billion, six hundred million in China. There's probably more than that now. So maybe, was there now seven billion people in the world? I didn't do the arithmetic, but take take a quarter of a billion, divide it by seven. Some of you are quick with math. How much do you think my piece of the rock would be worth? I don't think they're going to give it to me anymore. But it was donated as a gift to the world. There it sits in the Smithsonian. Listen. That thrills you, and you just look at that. I know some people are thrilled by art. I remember one time I was in the uh, I was in the uh, museum, an art museum. I don't know what it's called in New York, but it's the, the art museum in New York, not the Museum of Natural History. That thrilled me, but the art museum wasn't really thrilling me until I saw one painting that kind of captivated me and pulled me into the picture. It was called the picture was called the Storm. And uh, I, th there, for, for a brief moment, I could understand art, how art, how people can be taken in by art. But if that does something for you, and you can go to the Smithsonian and look at the Hope Diamond, if that's, of all the things to see at the Smithsonian, that would be last on my list to go see is the Hope Diamond. I'd want to see uh, Apollo 11. That's what I want to see. I want to see Bucky Lindy's airplane. The spirit of what St. Louis. That is, that is the things, I tell you the truth, before I want to see the Hope Diamond, I'd want to see Archie Bunker's chair. That's their thing. Oh. <laughs> to see the Hope Diamond just doesn't do it for me. But it was given as a gift to the world. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. Oh, the memories of Christmas. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Father, we pray today that in the brief few moments we spend together that our focus will be turned upon that unspeakable gift that you gave to the world when Jesus came and he was Emmanuel, God with us. Bless us, we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, his priceless gift. You see, the Hope Diamond, they can, they can, they can put a value on that. There, I can't think of anything in this world that, that, that a value can't be placed on it. People will say, oh, uh, this uh, piece of art is priceless. Well, it's not priceless because someone's going to insure it. What's, it. what's that insurance company in London? Lloyd's of London? Yeah. They'll put a price on it. They'll say, this is how much we'll insure it for, and this is how much you'll pay to have it insured. Now, what's this? Is there a commercial? Yeah. 
credit card commercial. This costs so much, and this costs so much. But her reaction when you give them prices, it's not prices. Somebody always has to pay. There are no free lunches in the world. There's a price on everything. Thanks be to God for his priceless gift, his indescribable gift. You, it's, it's hard to put words to it. In fact, it's a gift too wonderful for words. The gift of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave, or should we, we could rightly translate, he gifted to the world his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gifted to the world. I don't know the name of the fellow or the lady or the family that gave the hope diamond to the world. But I know the name of the one who gave his only begotten son. It is God the Father. And I know the name of the gift. It is Jesus. A gift too wonderful for the world. Now we can, we can spend hours talking about the worth and value of Jesus. But we won't. I have three points. You know, I thought to myself when I was marking my Bible, I wonder if people are looking and saying, oh my gosh, he has so many things marked over here with those. We won't be that long. Three things about this gift. Jesus is the gift that is the Savior. Justin read it this morning in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, said unto the shepherds, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior who saves from the penalty of sin. A Savior who saves from the power of sin. Sin. The penalty of sin. A penalty is imposed upon the lawbreakers. The world is under not only the curse, but under the judgment of God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, where it all began, the human story, the saga of the human condition. And the Lord commanded, chapter 2, verse 16, commanded this commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And in the original language, you know what it really says? In dying, you will die. You will die spiritually, and death will reign upon you your family, your grandchildren, and throughout each and every generation that lives on this earth. Death, physical death, is the result of spiritual death. The soul that sinneth, we read this throughout the Old Testament, the soul that sinneth shall die. The penalty, spiritual death, is a curse that's upon man. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. We'll bring in the, the New Testament on this now. Romans chapter 5. You can stay there because we're going to be in Romans for a little bit. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as <coughs> by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For all have sinned. He says it in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned. Come short of the glory of God. And there's a penalty. God's wrath must be appeased. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's a penalty. Jesus spoke about damnation. He said that hell was a place of outer darkness. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the flame, the flame is eternal and the worm never dies. I'm going to 
do we mean by the word worm? It means the soul. The soul doesn't die when it goes to hell. And the flame is never extinguished. In Revelation, we read about the dam. That it says that the smoke of their torment went up forever and ever and ever. But Jesus is a savior from the penalty of sin. In John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, we read that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And what that means is Jesus took upon himself the chastisement of our sins. He took upon himself the wrath of God upon sin. He became the penalty for sin. We read that in Isaiah. That uh, yet we did esteem him smitten and stricken of God. You see, the holiness of God cried out for a just penalty to be paid. And with each blow upon his face, with each nail that went in each hand and in, in his feet, with every stripe laid upon his back, he was taking our chastisement upon himself. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, that shall save from the penalty of sin. Thank God. Everyone who comes to Christ, I guess, we come to Christ in the same path, but there's different means by which we're saved. I will readily tell you, before I got saved, what was really working on me is, I was scared to die. And I was scared to go to hell. You know the old uh, story from the late 19th century where a little girl wrote a newspaper wanting to know if Santa Claus existed. And the editor wrote back and said, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Well, let me tell you, yes, my friend, there is a hell. There is a hell. Jesus said that when you read, I had a lady one time was so upset with me because you heard an evangelist one Sunday morning before a well-known evangelist, one Sunday morning before she came to church, the evangelist said there would be far more people likely to go to hell than heaven. But Jesus said that many there be that enter into the righteousness. Many there be. Few there be that enter into the righteousness. Doesn't have to be that way. I don't want to go to hell. I'm not wild about death. I'm, let's put that on the record right now. If I had a choice today between dying right now and living, I'll take living. I know where I'm going. Death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. It's a conquered enemy. It's a defeated enemy. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength, the sin of all. But thanks be to God, who always calls us to be triumphant through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, there may come a time in my life when I'm ready, when I'm sick or something. Corey Ten Boom tells a story. I love Corey Ten Boom. You know who Corey Ten Boom is? The hiding place. Mm -hmm. Corey Ten Boom told, it told us a story how, how she was afraid to die, and her father said, Oh, Corey, but God will give you dying grace. And Corey said, But well, Papa, when will I get that dying grace? And he said, Corey, when we go from the country to Amsterdam, or when we go from Amsterdam to the country, and then from the country back to Amsterdam, when does Papa give you your train ticket? She said, Just before we. He said, so it is with dying grace, my child. God will give you your ticket just before you go. But he saves from the penalties. He took our penalties. He also saves from the power of sin. Our gospel is a gospel of deliverance and transformation. I once heard a missionary, a home missionary, who was going to establish an Assembly of God church just down the street from, guess where? The Mormon Tabernacle. You could step out of his church, turn either left or right, whichever direction it was, and you could see the Mormon Tabernacle. 
And the question was raised, you know, much of Utah is so, and Idaho and, and parts of Arizona are very much uh, Mormon towards Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. And someone asked him, it was, uh, I tell you where we were at, we were at the Golden Corral. It's amazing, I can remember the lunches. But I, can't <laughs> I can remember stuff happened 50 years ago, but I can't tell you what happened yesterday. But I remember the luncheons very well, but I remember the question was asked him, how are you going, how do you think you're going to be successful in planting a church in the heartbeat of Mormonism? Just, just several hundred yards or several thousand yards, however far it was, away from the Mormon tabernacle. And he said, we will go there and we will preach transformation. He said, we have found, as we have walked the streets of Salt Lake City and Provo, we have found that people are hungry to hear about Christ's ability and power to deliver from sin and to make, uh, make a change, a tangible, real change in the hearts and lives I'll tell you what's really, uh, I, maybe, I should, maybe I should be ashamed of my next statement, but what really convinced me of the ability, and I've always believed it, and I've seen it, but what really convinced me about the ability of Jesus to change a life is my brother's salvation. You know what it's like to, uh, when you have a brother you've prayed for for years, and then you get a text message. Don't call me tonight on the way home from work. I'm in a small group. I'll call you when I get home. Or our brother will say, I want you to listen to this sermon and tell me what to think. This is what's good for me. Talk about the things of God. Here, here's, I don't want to go into great detail, but I'll tell you what really blessed my heart is one day I was rushing home from work because Olivia was sick about a year ago. They were rushing Olivia to the hospital. And I called my brother and I said, keep, keep Olivia in prayer. And he says, David, just hang on right now. Let's pray. My brother, and my family knows where my brother's come from. My brother prayed with me over the phone. That's the transformation. And the, and the working power of Jesus Christ to deliver from sin. To make a change in someone's life. Romans chapter 6, may I read some scriptures. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We don't have to serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Wow. Wow. Look at verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I, I, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Let me make this, make this very plain as I can. If people tell you it is hard to be a Christian, they are not speaking biblically. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Jesus said, take my yoke upon me, on you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He does the heavy lifting. What I have to do is, who am I going to yield myself to? 
Am I going to pick up and play around with sin, or am I going to yield myself to Jesus through prayer and worship and reading my Bible and crying out to Him? Who am I going to yield myself to? He's the one that does the heaven. We have to yield ourselves to Him. And He changes us. We used to sing a chorus in Bible school, the Word is working mightily in me. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see, the Word is working mightily in me. Jesus is working mightily in me. Jesus, through His Word and through the Spirit, through my interpersonal relationship with Him, makes the difference and makes the change. I love the hymns. Now, I like all, I, I, listen, you can throw me with just about any kind of music. Uh, not my way. She doesn't like some of the music that I listen to at times. I like a little bluegrass once in a while. I could take a little bit of hillbilly twang, twang or whatever. <laughs> I like the long hair classical music. I'm not saying I have a steady diet. You know? I like pancakes, but I don't eat them every day, believe me. But I like the new music that's being sung in a lot of places in church. But I'll tell you what. Don't throw the hymns out. There are some strong doctrinal things in the hymns. I love the hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And I love that verse. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Jesus breaks everything. The lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. He'll break the fetters. You got a fetter that he's broken today? Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to You can't do it. I can't do it. I can't be a better person. I am by nature a heathen. I, you know, if there's one thing that I do well, that's mess up and sin. I can sin as good as anybody can. But I don't want to. They asked a one of our teachers in Bible school was a pastor of a very successful church. He's an older man. Successful church in uh, Queens, New York. And he has Scotch, uh, 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 he's a Scotch Canadian. He has Scottish accent. I can't mimic his accent. I wish I could. But he said, people say to him when he's witnessing to him, Reverend, you can't come. Reverend, you can't go to the church. Reverend, you can't go down to the uh, this or that area. Reverend, you can't do this. Your religion won't allow it. And Brother Burgess said, it's not that my religion doesn't allow it. It's that I don't want to. And I can hear his voice. He's now with Jesus. He was in his 70s when we had him. 70 years old and he was still playing ace hockey with a bunch of other guys. In the I can't even walk on ice, much less speak. But uh, what a man. He said, brothers, brothers. Brothers, if you're talking to Jesus, that's where the change comes into your life. Jesus was the gift of the Savior. He was the gift of the Redeemer. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, he said, For ye were bought with a price. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, We were sold under sin. We were sold to sin. We were under the thumbprint of sin. And Jesus paid the redemption price for us. We were enslaved. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to read verse 18 through 20. I got a problem with the cataract, so if I'm winking at you, it's not because I like it, so I'm trying to get my eyes focused. Okay? But first, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were bought with corruptible things. As silver and gold from your vain conversation, your vain empty manner of life. Received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So what does that say? What does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to be purchased? He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt 
I could not pay. <coughs> I needed someone to wash my sins. You see, we were enslaved, and Jesus came down to the slave market, and he said, purchase. Not with corruptible things, not with the, not with the vain traditions of your, your fathers, not with the law.